another installment of my little series of videos explaining cable TV service as it's commonly applied. It's going to be changing quite a bit over the next few years. We're going to go more and more fiber. There's going to be more and more fiber to the home and more and more fiber to the curb type stuff going on. So I'm talking traditional HFC cable, hybrid fiber coax cable which is the norm for most of the country. Like I said, there's pure fiber solutions. There's all kinds of other things going on. This is just the most common where we take a signal from the office, we convert it to digital, optical, on a fiber. We put it into a, a node, fiber optic node, which outputs an amplified RF signal, you know, regular cable, and again, this is forward in return. We got signals coming from the field all the way back to the office. And of course, we've got our broadcast signals coming from the office. We've got broadcast, narrowband, and then we've got return. And of course, we've got power. That's a whole nother, whole nother ball of wax. Anyway, the office is sending us forward signal that's broadband or I should say broadcast, which means everybody sees it in the whole system. You've got a narrow cast signal, which is just the forward carriers that contain the DOCSIS channels mostly, which are your cable modem channels. The forward signal your cable modem is looking to lock onto, that's not broadcast, that's narrow cast, just to your node. Also just uh, to your node is the return path is usually isolated for just your node, so it has its own return path its own forward data path for those data carriers and there may be other channels that are narrow cast as well in uh, systems I've worked on the pay-per-view pay, uh, video on demand um, which is mostly free those carriers all worked on narrow cast as well so a lot of the spectrum would be broadband and then we have a little section of narrow cast channels which are mostly modems and uh, pay-per-view, video-on-demand type, type stuff. So, that's the three things. Um, let's go a step back, though, and look at talk about modulation for just a minute. I'm not going to go super basic. We have an RF carrier. We need to transmit information on an RF carrier. An RF carrier on a spectrum analyzer, if it's pure, just like an audio frequency that's pure, if it's pure, you're just going to see one thin line. If it's less pure, it'll be a fatter line and it'll have a little bit of stuff coming up at the bottom. This here, what I've drawn here, from 5 to 50 megahertz is the return spectrum that most systems are stuck with using. The um, system I came from had even a smaller return. Uh, some systems have a mid split which gives you a lot bigger return. Or a split up to the FM band. That little module I showed went up to 108. So we've got this narrow little return band and we need to pack as many modems into that return band as we can. So we're not going to choose a modulation like FM modulation because FM modulation varies a little bit. It's not just a carrier. The carrier has to deviate back and forth. So instead of just a skinny little carrier, it's going to deviate back and forth. It makes a little wider carrier so here's a picture of what may be a representative picture of uh, old-time NITSI video. And uh, PAL isn't that much different. The numbers are different. But in old-time Ford PAL channel that you'd pick up on your antenna or whatever else, it has three types of modulation in it. Your video carrier, basic signal, is AM modulated, amplitude modulated. And it is scanning across the frequency range, but it's amplitude modulated at any moment as it scans on that frequency range. Right at about 4.83 I wrote here, uh, starting from the zero, is a little burst. It's called a color burst. Or, you know, actually it's getting you tint phase out of this color burst, which is phase modulated in just this one little spot and all your color is packed into that little thing there. Anyway, so it's, I'm not going to go too de detailed. Phase modulation, 
amplitude modulation and your audio is frequency modulated. So you got three types of modulation in an old type TV signal. Now, uh, like I was trying to explain, frequency modulation, you're deviating the carrier a little bit, so it's going back and forth a little bit, jittering. That's what we call jitter on a frequency. On a carrier that's not supposed to move, we call it jitter. But it's purposeful jitter to frequency modulate it. Phase modulation is a much smaller, it's just a, the phase of the carrier is shifted just a little bit. So it's shifting a much smaller part in just one little spot here. But you can tease it out from frequency modulation, you can tease it out from amplitude modulation. All right, so we've got this narrow little band to get our return information back on. We need to pack in as much as we can. So each modem is going to fire back its own little carrier. It's going to hunt for a blank spot that nobody's using, and it's going to fire out a carrier. And this all gets real complicated. There's a handshake that goes on. There's a forward signal on the cable that the modem needs to pick up, the modem signal. There could be two or three different channels of that. And they've got different return uh, bands. For example, we might have one group of modems here, another group of modems here. And a lot of systems have a third one packed in. And this is the equipment in the head end can only do so much. It usually doesn't cover the whole spectrum. It covers a pack. And you need more, you put a second unit in. This all has to do with the cable modem termination system. So the return signal coming back from the modem is received by, in the long run, after it goes through lots, lots of machinations or whatever you want to say, um, ends up at the cable modem termination system. This is the brains of the whole operation. And it commands your modem in a, in a certain way. Uh, first, your modem is seeking around. It finds that forward frequency. From that forward frequency, it learns a few things. It knows where to look for the return frequency for that frequency band it's picking up for. It's able to eventually find the return frequency and, and get a block sync thing going on. You get the little light stay stable all of a sudden when the modem's linked up. Now, this process is called ranging because the modem has to adjust its output level in response to what the CMTS tells it to do. So, there's a certain amount of level. If this modem had just a steady output level, and it's broadcasting it back in the system, um, well, everybody's on a different tap down the line. They're on different amplifiers. They're different parts of the network. Instead of all these modems hitting at the same level, which is what you want them to do, ideally, is all hit the same level, uh, they wouldn't do that. They'd all be at different levels. And they'd be interfering with each other uh, because of that if they weren't high enough to get written over. So in a system, modern system, the CMTS tells the modem, turn down to this level. You know, I don't want you doing 55 dB, I want you doing 49 dB. And these are pretty typical levels. They, they do actually go that high. Uh, typical modems, we like to see them in the, I think it was 46, 48 we were aiming for kind of levels. So your modem is actually putting out a pretty strong signal but it's putting out, hopefully, a very pure signal. It's just a very skinny little carrier. And that carrier is modulated two different ways. It's not modulated frequency wise, uh, FM wise, because it would spread the carrier too much. You get too fat. We want the carrier nice and narrow, and so we can't frequency modulate it. So what we do is we use amplitude modulation, and we use phase shift modulation or quadrature. Incidence and quadrature. I and Q, sometimes this is called inside frequency or something like that. Uh, but I and Q are the two different data pieces we use because we're looking at to get binary out of this. We're looking for two states, you know, on and off. Um, and I should draw another chart and explain I and Q a little more detailed. Maybe I'll go into that. That's kind of a deep subject. But suffice it to say, You've got I on your vertical, and Q on your horizontal. You could reverse it, I don't know. Uh, but I is your AM modulation. Q is your phase shift. And you do these all to certain degrees. So the most basic one only had a few steps. We only had, uh, you know, if your amplitude was up or down. And then there was like a middle step too. So it was like four steps of amplitude. 
and then like four steps of quadrature and you plot them on a chart and it gives you these different data points. I'll have to show that in a later point but um, basically you've got a stepped incidence and a stepped quadrature modulation and those steps form a matrix and that matrix is your data. Um, I will have to draw that out I suppose. But let's leave that for now. We're, we're setting an amplitude and phase shifted carrier so it's a very steady it doesn't really perceptibly move at all when you see it on the analyzer. This would be what you'd see on a spectrum analyzer looking from 5 to 50 megahertz. You'd see a bunch of junk on the low end just crowding out junk and through that junk you'd see a couple of carriers you know one or two depending on how many different cable boxes types you have in your system these are the cable boxes talking back to the system these quer these carriers are done with a real low qualm rate and I'll have to explain that again that goes back to your I and Q there's uh, ones with a few steps and there's ones with many steps of course the more steps you have in your I and Q the more data you can pack into that frame these box returns work on really crude levels. They work on just a few simple steps. They're crude, they're simple, they're not carrying a whole lot of data back. Um, just you know what the status of your box and what you're ordering if you're ordering a pay-per-view, that's about all they do. They're not watching you on TV. There's not enough bandwidth for the cable box to watch you while you're eating your potato chips. There just isn't that kind of bandwidth. We're packed. We don't have that kind of free space to amble away. <laughs> I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's just not happen. It doesn't happen. So forget that paranoia. Anywho, we've got all this low end stuff, just like AM radio and all this other stuff getting in here, and all kinds of distortion and noise and stuff. These carriers are very robust. So even though they're not that big, they're not that well balanced, they do kind of do a sort of a level adjustment like the CMTS does. But they basically there, they basically communicate through all kinds of crud because they're very rugged, robust signals. They're simple, simple and robust. So these boxes hardly ever screw up, these box carriers. The only time we have trouble with box carriers is when a box goes rogue. And that's when a box will sit on a big carrier with no data on it and just block out the other boxes from using that spot. Because it's they say if the boxes are all transmitting at 10 megahertz and one box sends out this big rogue carrier and blasts it, the other boxes can't communicate. And that's a real nasty situation that you have to find the actual cable box, you know, within the big system. <laughs> it's not fun. It doesn't happen too often. We can have a rogue modem do the similar type thing. Um, that is also not very common. And there's a couple things modems can do that go rogue, but I'm not going to get into that. Um... What haven't I shown you on this uh, screen? The uh, This is what a digital forward channel looks like. To get off the subject a little bit. A digital channel that's on the forward. This is a forward ampli you know, analog channel. With all server modulations. The new digital channels are just flat as a pancake. And in fact, there's even in-channel frequency response to measure how flat this is. They want this nice and flat as a pancake and smooth and... It's pretty much the same process as going on the return, though. And when the return is packed, this becomes one big block sometimes. Because the carriers we packed in here so tight it'll look like just one big block. I drew this here as a representation of some more interference. So this stuff coming up on the bottom, it's kind of erasing your signal. This noise floor on the bottom, it might as well just be erasing your modems. Your modems carrier to noise ratio is being reduced. So if your modem was transmitting at 50 and your noise was zero, you'd have a 50 carrier to noise ratio. But now you've got eh, maybe 20, 30 dB of crud down here. Well, now you're only down to 40 or 30 dB of carrier to noise ratio, and that's starting to get marginal. So that's the kind of things you're, uh, that'll happen in the return spectrum. Um, this I drew here as at 27 megahertz because this could be a bunch of CB radio interference. We also get a little bit of interference from the 2 meter. See, uh, that's off this frequency, but we do get a little interference from hams once in a while, not so much on return. Uh, well, you can, the 10 meter band is right in there. 
this is just typical low end junk, a couple box carriers, and then I just wanted to show you how it takes away from the other your modem signals. So when you see linemen running around in their trucks and they're like doing strange stuff and they're just like looking at different wires and unhooking people one at a time and stuff like that and you're like what the heck are they doing? Well that's what they're doing. They're looking for someone putting a bunch of noise into the uh, system. And a real common one is grow lights. The uh, metal halide lights tend to make a real big bloopy interference through the whole thing and uh, can really mess up cable modem signal. I guess I'll talk a little bit more about I and Q. And I've talked about the network on a previous video, so I'm kind of over glossing over a lot of this that I did go through before about diplex filters and how the two-way cable goes. Okay, let's talk with a little more detail about quadrature amplitude modulation. And I called this axis quadrature as being phase modulated, and this I carrier is being amplitude modulated. In reality, they're both amplitude modulated. It's just that the uh, quadrature is 90 degrees shifted. So you've got one carrier frequency. You know, we're talking this digital return now, and the modem is just one little narrow band. One carrier frequency, but two carriers superimposed on each other. One's 90 degrees shifted. Um, I found uh, one of the, we call them cable bibles, and uh, I actually found a couple of them. And I was checking out what I put down here, make sure I was accurate. I'm a little bit off, not by much. This what I drew here would be called 16 qualm. You got 16, not across, but 16 s sectors. Um, so this is uh, quadrature phase shift key, and that's where you just turn on and off the. Uh, I and O carrier basically, so you got zero or you got one, you know, on each carrier. It only gives you that many bits, you know, four possibilities for the different phase angles. So then you start adding on uh, more steps, you know, they just more poles to it, not just four, but eight poles to it. Then they went to a 16 quam, which now has amplitude modulation added to it. So you've got these inside steps too. You know, these inside steps, not just the outside sweep. So that's basically it. I just wanted to be more definite about my terminology there on that. Let's see if I can make this more visible. Probably not. This is copyright of Motorola, by the way. And now their uh, broadband communication sector is now Eris. Motorola sold it off, I guess. So you go into 16 or 32, so instead of just having 4, or instead of just having 2 by 2, or 4 by 4, now you've got 64 by 64, or even 256 by 256. You can see there's a lot more data packed in to that one blast, that one moment of time. It also gets a lot more fragile, a lot less robust. When you're stepping with 256 steps all the way across from one extreme to the other, your range of amplitude on the one, you know, on either one, well then little tiny variances from distortions, from uh, interference, are far more likely to intrude than when you were only using, you know, four data points in a real crude structure. You know, that's a lot more robust than 256. Doxis is a word you'll hear a lot, and that's just the standard we use. Data over cable service interface specification. And I, don't, I guess there was a DOCSIS one, but that wasn't the be all end all. There were some other standards out. I know we used to use a modem called uh, Land City, which wasn't DOCSIS at all. So early on, there was a number of different services out there, a number of different standards out there that companies had, you know, proprietary, different companies had made. And you'd buy their gear, you'd buy their head-on gear, you'd buy their modems, which is what we did with Land City. Those worked very well, but they weren't any kind of standard other than their own. When DOCSIS 2 came out, 2.0, everybody started getting on board and producing DOCSIS modems um, as a standard. And then the head-on equipment was standardized too with DOCSIS. So DOCSIS really did a wonder for the whole cable modem thing. Just by giving us a standard everybody could agree on. 
now you've got intercompatibility between different brands of uh, head end equipment and different modem brands. And you can even have multiple mod modem brands in one system, as long as they're on the uh, standard. So basically that's it. You, this is called a constellation diagram, by the way. And we actually used to use that. They don't use it so much anymore. You still can use it. Some techs use it, but very few techs really use it. But by looking at a constellation, you'd see where all the data points, you'd actually see this. You'd actually see a chart on a screen. A lot more checks than this usually. Uh, you know, when you get to 56, you only end up looking at a quarter of the screen. It's called zoom. And you zoom into a quarter of the screen just because it's so big. Um, you can zoom into smaller, smaller parts. If you look at one quarter of the screen, you pr pretty much see what you need to see. Um, and there's ways technicians can tell. Ideally, all the dots hitting the center of the square, just one dot in each square, because they'd all be hitting over themselves, that would be like perfect signal. All the, There's no jitter at all. All your dots are hitting right in the middle of their zones. Boom, boom, boom. As things get shakier, like real life, this would be just a little bit of noise. You know, your dots are starting to spread just a little bit. This would be perfectly acceptable. Come on. You know, this would be a great quantum picture. Not the ideal when they're just one, you only see one dot they're all on top of each other, but real small spreads, nowhere near the borders. When they start spreading real near the borders, I put like three dots in most of these, but say the dots were like way out, spread apart. Now you're in a real marginal situation and you're going to start crossing border lines and start getting errors. So the more this data falls where it's supposed to fall into its little slots, you know, the better your modems will work. And by looking at a constellation on a big analyzer, we used to have constellation analyzers, you can actually tell the dots in the middle are real tight and the ones that's outside are spreading. That means one thing, like your AGC is off or something like that. Uh, certain effects would only happen if the modulator was bad. So there is a way to di you know diagnose certain things with the constellation. We don't use that so much anymore. We pretty much... Uh, go by MER, which is kind of a funky thing to go by, but it's all we really got. Well, there's bit error rate, BER and MER. MER kind of takes the place of uh, carrier to noise ratio for us, but it's it's not as uh, <laughs> it can be a little misleading sometimes. So that's the long story. Another errata point is. I see that some are going vertical with the uh, quadrature and some are using an incidence on the horizontal. Um, so my X and Y's are flipped, at least from one thing I saw. It doesn't really matter. This pattern is actually more or less symmetrical to a point in the center. And what we look for in the uh, constellation is a pattern of these bits, either spreading out really wide or being really focused, you know, good disperse and get near the borderline it's bad that's mostly what we're looking for there's also patterns that kind of look like a ring um, that's a particular type of jitter causing that uh, so there's different things you can pick out from the pattern but like I said it's not that heavily used anymore what I have left out of this whole discussion is error control and error correction and that is a huge topic, hugely complex. And it's also something that's evolving, and it's the biggest evolution we have. With uh, We have now DOCSIS 3.1 coming out. And, uh, oh my God, the compression, the correction algorithm is just so twisted. It's brilliant. Uh, it was stolen mostly from European phone, uh, you know, was the... Telephones always, the twisted pair of people are always the first to try to squeeze what they can out of that line. Just when you thought they've done what they possibly could, they figure out something else. Thanks for watching. Comments are welcome.